today we are tackling zone four zone four nick take us away cool so zone four is as i guess commonly referred to as a sub threshold if you're looking at your training peak zone so that basically means your percentages are about 94 percent up to 99 percent of your lactate threshold so we're not quite working at the point where we're fully accumulating lactate with essentially no oxygen um, being consumed. Um, but we are working as hard as we can almost go. Often you might think or hear people talking about, oh, I've redlined on that ride, um, especially around like a, a sort of a club cycling race um, or a, uh, even like a cross-country kind of run. Um, it might take 15, 20 minutes, um, even up to an hour. Um, you can really kind of redline at your top of your zone four or your threshold. So in this sort of threshold, we are accumulating lactate quite quickly. Um, and now the closer you get to 100%, uh, basically we're accumulating it quicker than we can process it. So we're starting to, to work without aerobic, uh, without, sorry, yeah, without aerobic or oxygen um, in terms of our metabolism. Now what that does is it sends our lactic uh, accumulation through the roof. Um, and as Matty would tell us a few weeks ago, those hydrogen ions that are floating around, they're the ones that are causing the trouble. They're going to start to make our muscles burn. Um, and we're going to start to be like, right, okay, I need to back off or I'm about to blow up. Um, and the old analogy with, with burning matches um, is, is a really great one for this in terms of every time you're spending, you know, five, ten minutes in zone four, you're taking off another match. Um, and it's just a, a matter of time before you run out of matches and you're, you're out there out the backside um, and unable to, to kind of keep pushing hard, so to speak. So it's an interesting area, I guess, the zone four, because often we find that people will will push quite, you know, quite comfortably at zone two in their training. They'll push into zone three on a, on a climb and then it's straight into zone five. They, they're kind of either pushing full on maximally mm or they're just kind of tucked underneath. They don't quite get into that zone four because it doesn't feel comfortable for that long. But it's a, an area where if you can spend some time training in zone four, then you can really improve your ability to clear that lactate at a, at a given speed so you can ride faster or you can run quicker or kayak faster. Um, so therefore your, your heart rate zone is such that if 170, say, is your lactic threshold, that doesn't often change too much. You're never going to get it to 180 might get it to 172, but not, well, not 180. So you just improve the ability to clear lactate on that. So you can go faster, you can go go stronger and go for longer at that period of time. Um, so it's a really important zone to kind of train within, um, but it's often one that is, is kind of mis, um, mistrained in or, or not quite trained appropriately for, for the benefits you can get out of it. So we bit like we talked about zone three last weekend can be a little bit of a, a junk training area um, it's, and you can kind of waste your time in there. If you could just push that a little bit harder up into zone four, you're going to get a greater benefit. Um, the tax on the body is not too much more and so therefore you're going to get a, a, a better um, training stimulus out the other side. Would you like to add anything to that so far? I think thinking back to our energy systems and some of the, uh, seem to be the <laughs> energy systems guy is um, in and I maybe didn't quite explain it very well last week, but in zone three, our aerobic energy system is running really well, and we're starting to get some anaerobic um, glycolytic action happening where it's not able to drop down into that aerobic energy system, so we're starting to get some lactate produced or lactic acid. Uh, and the difference between lactate and lactic acid is, I guess it's a good thing to cover while we're talking about it, but lactic acid only exists in the muscle or in the cell for a very short period of time. So it come, it's produced, and then almost immediately it dissociates into a lactate and a hydrogen ion. So when we're measuring the blood, we're measuring lactate in the blood, we're not actually measuring lactic acid because the lactate and the hydrogen ion are no longer connected to each other. So it's no longer lactic acid, it's just lactate if that makes sense. Essentially, it's the same thing, for want of a better word, but um, 
not quite the same thing. So you're starting to get some of this lactate produced, um, but your aerobic energy system still taking care of most of it. When you step up to zone four, uh, that's when this this anaerobic glycolytic system is starting to really kick into gear because you're asking your body to produce more energy than it can do aerobically to meet the demands of whatever you're doing. So that anaerobic glycolytic system really cranks up a lot more lactate, a lot more hydrogen ions are, are produced. And so training in this zone is, is a really sensitive zone for to, de to develop that uh, area that we're looking at developing. Yeah. So I guess from a, a how do we train the zone? Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of intervals, I, you know, I tend to go in that 10 to 20 minute block and you are working in you know zone four. The closer you can be to the the top of that zone, the, the better. But you don't want to switch over into zone five. Um, so you know you want to have your Garmin pole or whatever it is set to basically almost telling you the number of zone that you're in. Um, I know a lot of units now can sort of say, okay, you're zone four point three or four point four. Um, you want to kind of set that four point eight, four point nine, but not five. Um, and that will help with reducing the the amount of anaerobic work you're doing versus um, high level aerobic um, in that kind of 10 to 20 minute period with with uh, you know five minutes or so of rest um, I've been reading a wee bit in terms of recovery time from these intervals and it, it tends to be once you get to a certain period of time you don't get any greater benefit by going maybe five to ten minutes in that rest period at five minutes okay you, you're fully recovered right go again um, and that way you kind of get a bit of a, an accumulation of lactate um, still happening as well as the clearance through the recovery stage as well. Um, I do find it though a lot of people will struggle on a flat road to get up to zone mm. four, especially on a bike. Um, running is always a wee bit easier because you've got a, a greater resistance um, and a greater load from the, I guess, gravity effect. Um, but on a bike, on a flat road, it can be really hard to push a gear that quickly unless you're into a headwind. Um, so they work really well as, as hill intervals or, or finding some sort of undulation where you can really kind of grind it up um, on a hill to get your heart rate going as well. Um, I'd also suggest never jumping straight in from like a, a, you know, if you warm up, let's say it was 10 minutes in zone one, don't go from 10 minutes in zone one to trying to do three or four minutes in zone four. Um, you want to kind of give yourself a couple of little accelerations in your warm-up, um, get your heart rate up, bring it down, up, down, up, down, and then launch into some, some longer sort of 5, 10, 15-minute intervals in that zone 4 kind of range as well. I'll often use what I call an unstructured interval session where I find them really good in late base phase, uh, early speed phase when we're transitioning into more structured work. But when potentially... In the speed phase, closer to your event, the duration and the specificity of your training spent in different zones is, becomes more important. So what I find is it can be really useful for, for a two or three week period is doing what I call unstructured intervals, where you might go out uh, and run uh, a hilly course that you might know, and you might just go and run the hills hard, rather than going out and doing a specific interval length if you run the hills hard and then recover on the downhill, you're, you're getting a similar effect, but without being locked into that specific training zone, which some athletes can find quite taxing um, mentally and, and also physically to some degree as well. And so if you have a, a, a period of that type of training, then when it comes to your specific uh, time, when it's really important to you know accumulate that different time in those zones, or in zone four specifically, then you're a little bit more fresh and able to do that, as well as having the, that adaptation already starting to occur. Yeah, and make you know make sure you're aware that zone four training is, as Maddie said, it, it, it's a huge tax on the system. Um, you know, you're not likely to spend more than an hour in any in any given session in zone four, accumulative. Uh, so if you went out and tried to ride or run in zone four for an hour, it's going to suck and it's going to be hard and most people can't do it unless you're in a race situation. Um, oh, yeah, you're going to be destroyed and, for a couple of days afterwards if you do that. Yeah. Um, so you need to make sure that when you are in these periods of specific zone four training that you allow a couple of days of recovery out the other side. So you need a couple of mm -hmm. days of easy 
Um, even a, just a longer zone one, zone two session is okay. Um, but if you don't allow that recovery, you, you're going to end up either overtrain sick um, or run down pretty quick. Mm. Yeah. In, in terms of it being a sensitive training zone as well, if you're either new to training in terms of new to endurance training, or you've spent quite a few years doing your own self-guided training and it's consisted primarily of just going out and riding or running to how you feel, then doing some specific work in zone four can get you a lot of benefits because your body's not used to it. A lot of people, when they go out uh, for their long rides or long runs, long sessions, they'll naturally fall into that zone two uh, or zone three, because as we talked about last week, that feels kind of strong, that zone three. Not often will you venture up into zone four for any extended amount of time, apart from potentially riding up a really steep hard hill or, or, or attacking something on, on a run. So by structuring some specific time in zone four, you get some massive benefits relatively I'm not going to say easy, but relatively quickly, uh, but definitely not easy. Yeah, totally. And and zone four, or I guess, again, your threshold heart rate is a really cool uh, pacing, I guess, a, a structure in a race setting. Mm -hmm. um, again, the, the, the moment, and it's not quite as clear cut as bang, one minute you're anaerobic, next minute you're aerobic. Um, but... It, the moment you step across that threshold heart rate, you're you're working anaerobically, um, for want of a better better way to put it. And in a race setting, if you can keep yourself under that threshold um, and even go a few beats below, just to allow for some some sort of error, I guess, in, in testing, um, then you can be really kind of keeping yourself in check across a longer race, um, short race, you know, half an hour to an hour race. Um, you just want to be redlining the whole way. Um, but an Ironman sort of race is a great example in terms of keeping your heart rate down, especially on the, the bike. I mean, the swim, you've got no control over it generally because you can't monitor your heart rate as well. Um, but keeping your heart rate down, especially through transition on the bike, um, and then again, another transition, then you're going to have a much better run if you can kind of peg it back. Yeah. Mm, about that 10% below threshold heart rate is a really good pacing area for those long events, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good rule of thumb, actually, 10%. Mm. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is depending on the type of race that you're doing, the type of intervals that you do for zone four uh, can be quite different or a uh, way to optimize them. So if you're, say, training for an Ironman and it's going to be a long, you know, TT type type event, then, or the, the likes of, a, you know, a 100-mile gravel event, with it, it's quite a sustained effort. So doing those sustained efforts in zone four, really important, you know, from that sort of 10 to 20 minute window. If you're training for an, an event, not necessarily shorter in duration, but potentially where the bursts of zone four work that you're going to be doing are a bit shorter. So looking at, say, intervals down, even as low as, say, four minutes, four to 10 minutes, say like if it's a road race or a mountain bike race where there's a few pinches um, or definitely, you know, around like a 10K um, running event where you're going to be coming up into zone four or up and then back down a bit, up and back down. So you're visiting the accumulative time that you spend there over the session is potentially going to be the same. So rather than doing, say, three 10-minute intervals, you, you go back and you say do five, you know, sort of four-minute intervals. But your accumulative time, and I know you're rolling my eyes saying that doesn't uh, add up in terms of maths, but generally the uh, the accumulative time is still still the same. But the way your body is having to turn on the gas, if you like, and then recover from it, turn on and recover, is, is a lot different between those two events. Mm. And that's where you can get someone who's a really good time trialist but then chuck them in a road race and their legs blow out because they're not used to that surging, uh, even though they're able to generate a lot of sustained power when they've got to turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. They start to struggle a little bit. Yeah, totally. And that's, I guess, one of the fundamental sort of 
uh, areas of, of training, plan, uh, preparation and specificity. Mm. So, so the closer you get to your race time, the, you want to be as specific to the demands of that event. Um, you know, cross country mountain bike race is probably a prime example. Um, it was such a high demand um, sport and the course will dictate that completely. Um, again, same with, with triathlons, uh, running races, etc. The The course will dictate a lot. Yep. Um, and you can go and do a, a flat half marathon, let's say the Christchurch half marathon running, um, and then you can find a really hilly half marathon. Um, you know, Dunedin's got a wee hill in it. Um, I can't pick a decent hill half marathon off the top of my head, but there will be one out there. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely have a, a big look at what event you're training for. Uh, and then the demands of it, and then how you might adjust your sort of threshold type training for that. Um, and another question I get asked a lot is around about why would an endurance athlete who has to go and train or race uh, for a long period of time aerobically, why would they want to improve their anaerobic threshold? So I think a lot of people get the word anaerobic in their head and they think, oh, uh, I'm doing aerobic endurance exercise. And the, the key thing to think about is that when you go out and race, you race at a percentage of your anaerobic threshold normally. So say for a race, you race at, you're able to sustain 80% of your anaerobic threshold for the entire duration. And there's two people that sustain that 80% of their threshold for the same race. Now, the person with the higher threshold is going to have a faster time because their threshold was higher, so their overall race intensity is higher than the other person's. So even though we're talking about anaerobic energy production, it's actually also related to that aerobic capacity as well. So because we're racing at a percentage of our anaerobic threshold, the higher that anaerobic threshold is, the higher any given percentage of it is going to be on race day. And that's where it becomes really important for endurance athletes. Yeah. And and as people will, will hear next week, um, as we step into zone five, which is your maximal anaerobic um, zone, they are some of the best types of intervals to be doing to increase your aerobic capacity. Mm. Um, and like you said, it's it's a very confusing sort of terminology between aerobic and anaerobic because people just assume that uh, aerobics, okay, well, that's what I'm doing. I don't want to touch the anaerobic system um, because that's just for sprint athletes. Yep. Um, so it's, it's a really cool cool kind of, I guess, myth to be dispelling, I guess, at the same time. It is a, it's a complicated uh, subject. So hopefully everyone's starting to get a bit of a grasp on it now. Um, and if you don't, let us know if we've made it more confusing for you. Hopefully we haven't. And... Um, we can do our best to rectify that. Mm.